Hello, world. This is Luke Johnson from the educational and social media website, Noetic. You can go visit it over at noetic.online, where we provide a number of discussions, lectures, podcasts on intellectual history. And currently, I'm uh, making my way through a Civil War textbook for you. So you have to give me some feedback on that. Today, I'm with Bob Schutt. And we are doing, I believe, our 10th installment. Is that right? Uh, of yeah. Soren Kierkegaard's, yeah, sure yeah. Tr- yeah, of Soren Kierkegaard's training in Christianity. So what are we going to be talking about today, Bob? Oh, boy. Well, today we're going to be talking about sign of contradiction. Um, we're going to talk about the God-man again, but in a little different light. This is, this is going to be a kind of a rough, difficult session today. This is one of the hardest... Uh, areas so far in in the book here, Training in Christianity, that I think we've encountered. Uh, so uh, this may sound like we're going to struggle a little bit here, but I'm going to count on you to keep me keep me square. And uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense, ask a question, because I think we need to iron it out. And so we'll just kind of take it from there, okay? Okay, so we're going. To, I'm just going to back up just a little bit because we ended kind of like in an unusual place last uh, time, last study. So we're going to start with speaking about what Kierkegaard calls a sign of contradiction. And this is when a sign or a symbol, I guess we could say it, uh, has a contradiction within itself. And this is going to take a little explanation and some examples he has. Uh, so it's like trying to take ideas like jest and earnestness and put them together into a symbol. Well, how can you do that? That's difficult because jest is something that we do for an amusement and a joke. And earnestness is something that we do uh, out of uh, severity, out of an intense conviction. And so the two don't normally fuse together very well. Uh and there's no direct communication, and this is his point, there's no direct communication when you can say both or show both simultaneously. I, I like to call this paradoxical pairing, uh, where one cannot really understand the paradox directly because it doesn't communicate directly. And Kierkegaard is, is you know, known for his paradoxical uh, explanations of things, and I think that's what he's doing here. He's giving us an explanation of a contradiction, sign of contradiction, as a particular type of paradox that really is using opposites that just simply cannot be fused or harmonized, maybe even be a better word, together. And when you run into such a paradox here, or such a conflict, it prompts you to reflect on it. So such a situation usually grabs our attention and we hear this, we don't know what to do with it because we're going to try to resolve it with our, with our intellectual minds and it's going to create all sorts of confusion in our minds because they are irreconcilable to a point. So in the scriptures, the God-man, God-man, is a sign of contradiction. In other words, it's a, the paradox with the capital P is that you, you cannot take God and man and fuse them and harmonize them together. It's impossible because the definition of God and the definition of man are, are opposing definitions. One, so to speak, one uh, will not allow the other to, uh, to exist in the same realm in the same in the same individual so if a man tries to unify god man through speculation which is what it usually comes down to he destroys the contradiction by removing the offense so when you have two things that are somewhat opposites or on opposite poles you can bring them together if you're willing to speculate and if you're willing to maybe even compromise a little bit, you can bring these two opposites together. Uh, and the reason is because you've removed the offense. Can, can I, can I jump? Uh, can I ask a question and maybe insert something? Yes. Well, maybe, maybe there are two questions. All right. I'll, I'll provide them in the form of questions. 
The first is, could you conceptually clarify the diametrical nature of the concepts of God and man and why they're irreconcilable? I mean, I know. I mean, I, I know because I've done so much work in Kierkegaard, but I think maybe for the audience, they might be like, I'm not so sure God and man are so far apart. Okay. Um, and so maybe what that means, right? We may want to talk about that in terms of um, capacities or, or, or sin or something of, of that nature, why these things are so distinct and why they're so polar. Um, but then the other question is, um, how do, if they are so radically in opposition to one another, how we make that fit with our understanding of the Imago Dei? specific you know mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that man is made in the image of god and how how you understand that if they are so diametrically opposed okay i'll, I'll do my best there but to step in if i don't quite reach the goal here um first of all i think the obvious answer would be that god is infinite man is not infinite being infinite god has infinite qualities omniscience omnipotence and uh, omnipresence this is usually how God is defined. I don't use those terms to define him, but just for the sake of the discussion, I, I will. Uh, so God has infinite qualities. Man does not have infinite qualities. Um, God created man. Man did not create God. Uh, so we have these spiritual... But also, we have a difference in spiritual nature. Uh, man seeks his own... A will, and when he does, it is not the same will as God seeks. So we have a difference in the will of man versus the will of God. <clears throat> so we we define man. Now we define man after the fall as sinful, and God is holy. So th- this is a very important difference. At least we see now that God is completely holy, righteous, and man is not because man has gone after his own will which brings him in a different spiritual direction ethical moral direction however in answer to part b of your question we can reconcile them uh, by simply stating that god and man really are the same or that as the mormons say man will grow into god Okay, so we, we, we are infinite. We had an infinite beginning and then we came to earth and we will have an infinite end. So you can reconcile them by de- redefining man in such a way that you make him into a god or god. But I don't, I think, I don't think that's the doctrine we want to put out there, though, about, or, or is it? I don't know. I mean, look, I don't know what, the pre, what pre-existence or what, you know, the immortality of the soul will be like. So maybe there's a kernel of truth to it, but I mean, the Imago Dei, I mean, how do you understand the Imago Dei? I mean, I guess I would think about it in terms of more of like, we bear a faint resemblance. Yeah. Imago Dei is a you know, really difficult term, but before I, I I'm just want to skip over this, uh, what I was giving you was a speculation now, this is, this is what Kierkegaard was speaking about. So I wanted to make sure we make that connection. If we want to speculate, we can make them work together by changing the whole principle of what man is and how we define man. So man is made in the likeness of God uh, in the Imago Dei. Uh, and, and that's been taken by uh, Gnosticists to mean that God is in every one of us. Every one of us is God. That spark, that amber within us, all it needs is to be fanned and and uh, it will burst into the flame of divinity. So each one of us is God. It's almost like the... Uh, uh, oh, I can't think of the, what that was. Uh, everything is God and God is everything. Definition. And, and, and it puts us in that position there. But that's not the way the Imago Dei was meant to be. The Imago Dei is that we have, and this is my (laughs) definition, okay? My definition is that the Imago Dei is God has given us a certain abilities, certain abilities in our nature. 
in order to be able to recognize God. So we are like God enough in order to see God's qualities. See, without, in other words, we have, let's say, vision. We can, we can see, God's given us vision so that we can see things. Uh, and, and with sight, we are able to perceive of God through nature. We're able to perceive of God through our vision. He's given us hearing so we can perceive God through our hearing. It's not that we're made like God. It's we're made in his image, which is a little different. So it's not saying you're made in somebody's image, meaning you're like God in every way. But for me, the Imago Dei is being made with enough likeness in order to recognize God's qualities and character. So, so just, just to draw this out a little bit, God gives us not unbounded reason and intelligence right. and freedom, but enough to discern that there may be a higher power that has such things. Yeah. And, and it says in there that God gave man the idea of the infinite. Uh, not that he made man infinite, but he allowed man to perceive of the existence of the infinite. That's, that's very interesting because I think I, I recently did a, um, a recording of the entry for Anselm from the 1911 oh. Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. And I could see how this conception that you have of the Imago Dei would fit in rather well with the ontological argument for the existence of God. Yeah, it probably does. But that, that's, a, that's a side note. So the, these, I think you've answered my questions adequately. And I have this ability to totally like t steer and redirect the lesson. So why don't you go back to your, your lecture? Oh, okay. and, 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 but, but I think you've adequately answered those questions. Okay, thank you. So the contradiction between being God and an individual man as the one and the only God man is a problem. So when we say that man is divine, we can kind of speculate and, and, and deal with that and maybe say, okay, yeah, God is man, man is God and that. But when, what Kierkegaard is saying here is that in the gospel, we find out that there's a contradiction here that is unreconcilable because it's an individual man who's God, not mankind in the uh, the abstract, but an individual man is God, and so these things oppose one another. But Bob, don't you know Jesus was just trying to teach us how to be gods? He was just an ascended master, right? Yeah, that's uh, one one idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being facetious. No, yeah, no, that's I'm glad you brought it up because yes, that again is is part of the speculation as to how do we get out of this dilemma without having faith. How do we, how do, we do this? My kid could God will help us out here. So God-man is a sign of contradiction because as a paradoxical being, he reveals the thoughts of hearts. But as a speculative unity, the paradox is merely a doctrine and does not have such a quality to reveal the heart. So let me kind of reduce this a little bit. This is kind of already some of my own words in there. But the idea here is that uh, what Kierkegaard is saying is as the paradox, God is able to reveal the heart of man as the paradox. If we turn God into doctrine, he's no longer paradoxical and therefore no longer reveals the heart. This is the danger of having doctrine and existential being. And this is why we need to bring our faith back into the existential being of Jesus rather than the doctrine of Jesus. Go ahead. So let me so so let me ask you this. How does God being the God man being a paradox that's not a part of a doctrine? How does that reveal the heart of man? I mean, I think I know, but I just want you to elaborate on this for the audience. And then two, is it impossible to have paradoxes as part of a doctrine? 
Because, I mean, the thing is, there are belief systems out there, like, I don't know, that are replete with paradoxes. Mm -hmm. Like, like that, you know, people are upside down in Australia right now. Um, Because there's, but there's no up and down. (laughs) But so it, you know. There are, uh, we can run in, we can run into paradoxes in doctrine and elsewhere. But those are not existential doctrines. Those are not doctrines of existence. They're doctrines of the mind and the brain. And I think that's the difference that we run into here. We're not speaking about what, what happens in the reason, answer your first question now, the reason that Kierkegaard is saying this about the paradox as being able to reveal the heart is because this paradox with the capital P is irreconcilable man cannot solve it and he's always trying to solve it by by coming up with doctrines to explain away this paradox but the paradox itself must exist as a paradox because it frustrates man and it it uh what's the word um it it causes man to give up on his intellectual pursuit it, it, well, what about some theologians who claim they have solved the paradox, such as Hegel or Schleiermacher or someone like that? They're like, oh, no, no, no. I, Yeah, it, the, Jesus was a paradox for me, but then I figured it out. Yeah. Well, then he's no longer a paradox and he's no longer able to reveal the heart. But you'd have to follow their thinking and see where it brings them. And usually it brings them, as we know, in the end, it brings them to man is God. And uh, that's not the path we want to go down here. Uh, again, this is what some religions have done to, re- to, re- to remove the tension of the paradox. That thing that says, man, you cannot know this. Luke, you cannot know this. You say, oh, no way. I'm going to figure it out, right? It just makes you want to <laughs> figure it out. If you're anything like me, you know, don't tell me I can't understand something because now you really got me, <laughs> got me cooking here. But that's the paradox. The paradox says, I'm, this is something you, you man cannot know. And that frustrates, literally frustrates the hell out of us. We want to know it. But that's what the paradox that he's speaking about is doing here. That's what, and then, you know, Kierkegaard's writings are, are replete with this idea, but they're not always very obvious in his works. But if you have this idea and you reread him, you'll see it, all sorts of these, uh, these footsteps, traces through it. Uh, so in a modern view, everything is needed to be direct. Where in modern thought... The God-man is a fantastic unity, but this is not so in Scripture. So what he's saying that in modernity, uh, what they've done is they've taken this whole God-man thing and they've somehow turned it into some kind of a fantastic unity. Uh, And I, I, I hesitate to use the Trinity, but that's kind of an example here. We, we, if we turn the idea of the God-man into a trinity, we can almost say, okay, I understand it, on to the next thing now. I've got the trinity down, now I don't have to worry about it, I can move on to the next thing. So we have to be careful of turning the God-man into something that we think we understand, but we really need to allow this to confront us if it's going to be transformative in our lives. Uh, God-man is an individual man, not an observable, not not observable from the point of view of eternity. Uh, So, let me just continue on for a minute before we get there. Some theologies try to resolve this conflict by speculating or speculation rolled into doctrine, which is what you were talking about before. Uh, It therefore no longer reveals the heart. So, When you read, let's talk about the Trinity. When you understand the God-man, the God-man confronts you and it reveals your incapacity to resolve the issue. But when you run into a speculative doctrine, 
like the Trinity, it no longer has an existential quality. And it no longer reveals your heart. How many people pray to the Trinity, Luke? You know, do you pray? To I the- mean, I, 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 well, this, I, I'm, I mean, we, we've sort of been bat, we've been covering this ground the past couple of weeks. Cause you asked me the other day was the last time I, not the other day, but I think maybe a month ago, you asked me if I ever prayed to the Holy ghost right. or something like that. Right. And I was like, I don't think I do that. Um, but this is a, I, I want to say that no one and everyone simultaneously, right. Can like, because the way that I'm conceiving of the Trinity, if these are interde- interdependent aspects of God, mm-hmm. if I mm-hmm. pray to one of them and I not praying to them all. Right. And then this raises other questions too, about how we're shifting away from this God man duality into Trinity, Trinity stuff. It makes me so curious why Kierkegaard didn't talk about the Trinity and kept it at the God man. And so, yeah, I think I know so, why. So that was, yeah. Yeah, so what so figure out how you want to handle those questions. Yeah, so. yeah. No, right. Uh if the Trinity we keep it as the paradox would be okay. But the problem is when it becomes a doctrine, it's not okay. Uh and that's that's a problem. You know, when it becomes a something written on a piece of paper that you have to memorize, it it's not okay. The doctrine must remain in the God-man. The doctrine of the Trinity must remain in the God-man. And I think Kierkegaard avoids the Trinity because I think he believes, I'm going to speak from my point of view, I think he believes that it is more speculation and will diminish the contradiction of God-man. Now it may not, but he wants to be sure that our understanding is focused not on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but on God, man. And he specifically chooses this to, to uh, make his point. So like you said... You know, it's, you know what's so interesting is that... And I know this is going against Trinitarian doctrine to say this, but like... Right, like was, it, was it after Jesus had been resurrected, but before he had ascended into heaven that he said that he would send a helper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In the form of the Holy ghost. Yeah. So, so there was a time when the apostles were just thinking about God, man. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, and Jesus ascends into heaven. Right. And then was it the, was the experience in the upper room where the, the presence of the Holy spirit was felt and they understood that there was this third aspect. Yeah. And, and, that, and that these experiences occur in time. And this is eventually how we got the concept of the Trinity. But so, so at a, a point in very, very early Christianity, we were talking about God, man. And then not too long afterwards, we're talking about a Trinity, perhaps maybe depending on when you want to put the marker, we could say the council of Nicaea or something like that. So maybe the, what that happened in the fourth century BC. Is that right? So, or fourth century. Well, that's when it was made Um, official. It was made official. It it, it was in the, beliefs earlier than that of course so so it so so uh so at one point we got christianity that's like kind of dualist in nature and then it becomes trinitarian but then when it's trinitarian it was always trinitarian because all these three things were present at the very beginning so i don't know if that's any clue into why kierkegaard is emphasizing god man over trinity maybe he's trying to get as close to possible the offense that the apostles had to deal with when when Jesus Christ was walking and talking amongst them. I, I'm just throwing that out there. Is that that that's what they were thinking about? They were thinking about this man as the Son of God. They weren't necessarily thinking about the Holy Spirit at that point. Is that a wrong way to talk about it? I don't know. No, I don't think I'm, I don't think I I can really get into their head as to exactly why. I know that Paul. And the gospel is filled with the discussions about Jesus being God. And uh, the implication is that the Holy Spirit is divine all throughout the Bible. So the Holy Spirit is also God. But the problem comes not in understanding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the problem comes in misunderstanding God. If we have the proper understanding of God, I think it all makes 
much more sense. I, I shouldn't say it, it's not sense in, in, in the idea that we've nullified the paradox, but we're able to understand why it's paradoxical and the meaning of the paradox here. So I don't know what you would call it if we had the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But see, that's not the same thing. See, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not as a paradox as God, man, because man is not really in the equation of the Trinities. No, Father, it went, yeah, we're not, we're not really trying to say that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are opposites of each other. But here, here we're seeing that the, that man and God are opposites of each other, and so he's dealing with kind of a different question here. Right. Yeah. The the Son of God is all right. So here, how how about this? The God Man is the Son of God in the Trinity. Yeah. So the God Man is a paradox that makes up the totality of the Trinity. So it, it, did we, do we figure it out? Yeah, I think that's a good way to understand it, that the paradox is within God and man and the son, who is the son, and the son is, you know, the, the son and the Trinity in the Trinitarian idea. I think we figured it out. Yeah, I think we did. I think we figured it out. We did good. We did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, it's when one get in his words, it's when one gazes into this contradiction that God sees into the heart, and through this man is judged. It's because of the contradiction that man is faced with a choice. We were talking earlier about that. We have to bring people to a point where they see the contradiction, and they think there's no way out other than to make a choice now. Either I believe or I don't believe. Not, I'm not sure. Either way, I both believe and I don't believe. What Kierkegaard wants to do for mankind here, especially in Denmark, is to say, you must make a choice. You've got to go in one way or the other way. So make your choice. But people were not making choices in his day. They were letting other people make the choices for them. You know, I'm born into a Christian family, so I'm Christian. You know, I'm I'm born in Denmark, so I guess I'm a Christian. Instead of making a decision, what well, do you want to be a Christian? Well, I never thought of that. You know, <laughs> that's that's what Kierkegaard is after here. And I think it's applicable to us as well in our in our uh, world and in our country as well. People need to be brought to the point Christianity is a choice. You're not born with it. I'm sorry. You're not. Uh, one must either... I, hmm? I, I remember, just to illustrate that, I remember when I was like a little kid and I we'd have to take like world history classes or something like that. So maybe not a little, maybe like 11 or 12. Yeah, yeah. And I, w I would see like these uh, global, uh, s this global census and there'd be like, I don't know, like, what is it? Like 1.5 billion Christians. And I was like, yeah, my side is winning. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like it was like the world cup of religions. Yeah. And I was like, oh, oh, but we got, we got to look, we got to look out for Islam. It's sneaking up on us. Yeah, we got, we got, <laughs> it's sneaking up on us. <laughs> Very interesting, Lucas. Uh, did you ever go through something like that where you're like, yeah, I'm number one, yeah. America, Christianity? Well, when I was a Roman Catholic, when I was a young child, well, not even a young child, almost into my early teens, I couldn't understand why somebody would not be a Roman Catholic. I just couldn't understand it. You know? <laughs> so I guess it's in the same, same ballpark as what you're saying. I'm thinking, you know, why would somebody not believe in Roman Catholicism? It makes sense to what, me. What's what's not to love? What's, what's not, not to, to love, love Bob? Yeah. <laughs> and here I am. And, uh, <laughs> yet here I am today with you here. My goodness. <laughs> oh boy. So this modern age, he says, 
Kierkegaard says this modern age has completely transformed Christianity into a direct communication by leaving out the communicator, the God-man himself. So he's kind of taking us down this path to say, okay, what happens if you do away with the God-man? Well, you completely transform Christianity into something else. Okay, in the last 1800 years, he says, since Christ, he as a person has been forgotten. Only his teaching remains, and even that has been compromised. Now, people might argue with that. Have we forgotten Jesus Christ as a person? Have we turned him into something else besides a yes. person? Okay. Yes. Now. <laughs> all the time. All people do. I talk to them. They, they, they think he's a yoga instructor or something. <laughs> Uh, they're like, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. He was, a, he, he was a great mystic or something. And I'm, just, I, and then I'm, I'm, I just, I don't, I don't know what to say after that, Bob. Right. I don't know what to say. Well, what Kierkegaard is implying here is that Jesus Christ is an existential being. He's a person. He's a, he's a being. If we can't deal with the idea of person, he is a being. We must understand him as a being, not as some remote doctrine or, uh, like you said, some, some trying to turn him into a, a, a yoga instructor. You know, that's not who he is. I'm, I'm, tr I, I'm not trying to be blasphemous, but I, 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 I really do think people who are comfortable with thinking of Jesus as a yoga instructor in 2008. Yeah, and, and he's not the proverbial greeting card Jesus, the little Jesus in a manger that we feel sorry for, and then the Jesus on the cross, who we also feel sorry for. That's not who Jesus was. So it's the real Jesus is is a little different. Uh, so now we go... To, well, it's going to just yeah. it's, a, it's a lot it's a lot different you know and I actually think there's some really interesting debates going on about like what the phys, you know there's a lot of debate about the the actual physical if it matters you probably probably doesn't does it matter doesn't matter like what the the physical incarnation yeah. of Jesus right yeah like there's fights over his whiteness his potential blackness his potential brownness yeah uh even his beauty if he was beautiful or not, because the 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 image of Jesus that we are given uh, through religion is um, this like uh, is the Jesus Christ superstar Jesus. That's and, a, that's another good example of another yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and we're and we have to think about how plausible that is, given the region, given the commandments about men and how long they could grow their hair back then, and. Yeah, you know yeah, other stuff. Yeah. You know this very. I maybe you see. I I don't know if it's a significant area of inquiry or not, but it seems like to me like it might be kind of important to to get it right about what Jesus actually looked like. It might be telling of something. Well, remember last week I said when you and I make our our movie, we're going to get Danny DeVito to star as Jesus. I Danny DeVito. I don't know who I would cast as my Jesus. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think it'd be a little darker. I think it'd be a little darker. Darker than Danny? <laughs> okay. A little darker. A little darker. Think... So that, that's a good question. That's kind of a funny question to play with, to toy around with, was who would you feel comfortable portraying Jesus? And I say Danny DeVito it, it, only, it, yeah, tongue-in-cheek. I'm saying him tongue-in-cheek, please, you know. <laughs> but, it uh, can't be Morgan Freeman anymore. No. He, he's in, and he, Mor the Morgan Freeman was her the go-to uh, God character, so he, he's been taken out yeah. by the uh, Me Too movement, so got to find another candidate. <laughs> okay, so we go to lesson two, page 112. The form of a servant means unrecognizableness, which is incognito. This is where it's not where, but, but it's getting deeper now. It's getting more difficult, especially to try to explain it. So have pity on me here, Luke. Okay, the idea of unrecognizableness. Uh, it appears, it, it means not to appear in one's proper role. Like a police officer goes undercover. He's incognito, right? 
You don't know he's a cop. He's really a cop, but you don't know it. He still has all the powers of a police officer, but he's dressed in plain clothes, maybe even got jeans with holes in them and stuff. Uh, but he, nevertheless, he's still a police officer. In the same manner, God appears incognito as man. But the modern age has done away with this by making him, Jesus, a fantastic person, recognizable only through direct communication. Now, I'm going to have to wait a little while till we talk about direct and indirect communication, but you'll probably get an idea as we go. When we look at when we look at it, Christ will to be incognito. This wasn't an accident that happened. God wanted to be incognito. He did not want to be revealed on the earth as man, as he walked. This is a key to understanding why Jesus was so mysterious about his identity. He, he knew who he was, but he knew he could not directly tell it to people. They had to... Why, why, didn't he want, why didn't God want to be like, yo, check it out, I'm the Messiah? Because as, it, as his, the example in the Gospels of when Peter comes to the knowledge, he said, blessed art you, Simon Barjona, of course, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. So the idea is it has to be revealed to us through faith, not through intellect, not through. Is this because of the, 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 because if God did come down like that and be like, yo, check it out. I'm God that, um, people wouldn't enter into the proper relationship. Is that why? Absolutely Is that because right. they would, they yeah. would just be groveling, you know, just, just groveling worshipers and wouldn't, come to know God personally, which is that this very delicate balance that he had to do, right? He had to be incognito, but kind of at, at moments well, divulge his, his true nature. Yeah. If they had seen Jesus as the God man without the revelation and without the faith, they would have turned him into a pagan God man. And, building statues to him and all that kind of stuff that goes along with the pagan idea that this man is God and they would have, you know, sacrificed uh, calves and bulls to him and they would have done all sorts of things that, that is in the pagan idea. So it, it would have not even diminished, it would have destroyed the true identity of God-man and turned it into a pagan identity of God, which is what we're in danger of doing today, and which is what Kierkegaard thinks they were in danger of doing in his day. So most people in Christen, Christendom believed that if they were alive during the time of Christ, they would have most certainly recognized that he was God. But this isn't the case. So this is kind of dealing just with what your question says. This misperception was that one could perceive such a thing directly. So if you went there in Jerusalem in the year 20, 25, you would see Jesus teaching and you'd say, well, of course I recognize this guy. I can tell this is God in the flesh. And God says, no, you wouldn't. Because Jesus did not communicate this directly. I, You know what I think we just did, Bob? What's that? I think we just... Uh, in, inadvertently created the script for the fourth Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure movie. <laughs> there needs to be, there needs to be a time travel movie that tests this hypothesis out. Oh, <laughs> you know the the movies where they like they go back in time to meet like Napoleon and, yeah. and Socrates so they can ace their history test. Okay. okay, we need we need to ship modern Christians back in time to see if they would actually be able to identify Christ, or they could ship the true Christ into present time and see if they can identify him. <laughs> Bill and Ted. All right. So Bill, Bill and Ted are entering midlife. They're really <laughs> starting to question. <laughs> they're really starting to question the meaning of things. Wild stallions has brought them all sorts of money, fame, girls, all of it, but they want something more. 
and they need to time travel and meet this Jesus man. Mm-hmm. There we go. I think we just came up with, I do think we just made, I think we just had a hundred million dollar movie. Okay. Well, now you don't need to look for sponsors, Luke. You've, you, you've done it yourself. <laughs> I got a million of these ideas. So okay. in case, in case anybody just wants to hire me as a Hollywood consultant all day long, an, idea, all day long. an ideologist, we've got a new name for you. Okay. So back to Kierkegaard. He was, he's talking about Christ was very God and therefore to a special degree, God was unrecognizable. So since Jesus was God and man, and even the disciples really couldn't get it, it shows that he was unrec the God part was unrecognizable. But today, and in Kierkegaard's day, Christ has been poetized. Now this is kind of an interesting term, but I think poetized for me means he was turned into some kind of a poetic hero, kind of a super figure. And that's why, that, that's very similar to Jesus Christ Superstar uh, and even other, other movies and even sermonize, sermons that sermonize about Christ. They tend to, to turn Jesus into some kind of a poetic character of which he was not. Uh, it was... Christ's free will and determination from all eternity to be incognito. Now, this is a statement that Kierkegaard makes, Luke. He says, I'll read it again. It was Christ's free will and determination from all eternity to be incognito. Now, by this statement, Kierkegaard gives us a little insight into his own theology, that Christ was an eternal being. Now, he doesn't usually give us these clues about what Kierkegaard's theology is, but I think this is a little bit of insight into what he believed about Christ. He did not believe that Christ was just born and then became God, but he believes that he was always a being. He always existed as God and always wanted to be incognito. So the reason is that faith was required to see this. And there was no other way for man to walk. Since faith is transformative, knowledge is not. This is another key issue that kind of splits the road or puts the fork in the road. You go down the path of knowledge, you do not become transformed into the image of Christ. Only when you go down the path of faith is that belief transformative and you begin to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's... I will, I will say that knowledge can lead you up to the decision point. It can. It can. Kierkegaard would say the same thing. Well, here, here, well, here's a question I have for you, in the sense that you and I have an advantage that the early apostles did not have, in the sense that we have, you know, we have the Bible. Um, we we have the episodes of Jesus's life recorded for us. Um, we have the reverberations of the incarnation through history passed down to us. Um, we have Bible prophecy fulfilled. There's a lot of advantages that we have as a later generation. And Kierkegaard talks about this in the philosophical fragments, but how, how did these lowly fishermen and tax collectors just see through the disguise and know that they were dealing with the son of God. Like you and I know what you and I know some things to look for. Mm -hmm. How did they, how did they know what, I mean, these were not rabbis, right? I mean, maybe the right. These weren't rabbis, right? And there was anybody else a rabbi. No, they weren't rabbis. No, these were lowly people. How were they able to figure it out? They didn't. When they so how did they leave? How did they leave their fishing and tax collecting behind? Well, Jesus was a rabbi. He went around, and he it was just the custom in those days. You know, if a rabbi comes up to you and approaches you and tells you, "I want you to walk with me," they kind of drop what they're doing and and walk with the rabbi. This was an honor to be chosen by a rabbi. It's not that, you know, and I know the movies show Jesus appearing with light behind his head and everything, and Thomas and all these guys, James sees him and says, oh man, this is the Lord. They didn't know he was the Lord. 
that's what that's what Kierkegaard is reminding us of. They saw him as a rabbi, and they 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 knew he was smarter than they was, and they knew he was a spiritual teacher, but they didn't really know he was the Lord. That's why he kept saying, "You have little faith." You know, how much longer do I have to be with you before you you recognize me? For you know, and still you don't know who I am. And, and, and it was this this uh, veil in front of their eyes because they were looking at knowledge and it wasn't that's why he says you have little faith because they weren't looking at him through the eyes of faith they were looking at him through the eyes of he was a rabbi he was a teacher and so it wasn't until after the resurrection that they finally understood this man truly is the son of god this man truly is god incarnate well, what kept them to, down that path, right? If they didn't find out until after the resurrection, yeah. or they or they didn't have some sense of it until like right up until the crucifixion or whatever else, what was Jesus doing to get them to continue to follow him if they weren't able to discern who he was at the outset? I think one of the things or one of the quotes that comes to mind is that uh, they they said to Jesus, "Where should we go? Whomever, who else can we go to who offers us eternal life?" So Jesus was offering them eternal life. He was he was teaching them something that they never heard before. So as a teacher, he was far superior. Even the even the other rabbis, Nicodemus comes to him and says, "I know you're a great teacher." Who, who knows the wonders of God. So he had a great reputation for being a, a wonderful master, a wonderful teacher. And that kind of kept them, kept the disciples following Jesus. He gave them something that they, they weren't able to get from anywhere else, even though they didn't understand it. I think they knew someone was great, that this man Jesus was great. They didn't quite know how great, but even then, when Jesus was in the boat and the storm came, and he and he said, uh, he said, uh, cease, you know, to the winds, and the winds ceased, and they looked at each other and they said, "What kind of man is this that even the winds obey him?" They still couldn't figure it out with the intellect. It it took that revelation by God to understand it was something through faith that had to come to them, so. So Kierkegaard goes on here and he says, a man who chooses to be incognito as Christ did does so to make himself appear lower than he is. Uh, so this is kind of the rule of thumb. If you go incognito like an officer, he doesn't dress up as the captain. He dresses up as a street person so he can fit in with the street people and arrest people or solve his crimes. So this is what Kierkegaard is saying. When you go incognito, you usually go to somebody lower than yourself. So he gives us a story here. He says, a noble man who wants to assume an identity and appear incognito as an egoist, somebody who is in deep love with himself, uh, he discloses himself to another person that he's not really that person, but a humble and noble man. So in this story here, and sometimes you got to read these several times over <laughs> to figure it out. But in this story, you have a noble man, a good man, and he wants to appear to others as though he's an egoist, as though he's in love with himself. And he goes about doing this throughout the town. But he's got a friend that doesn't want him to believe this. So he confides in him. He says, you know, you know, Luke, I'm not really an egoist. You know me. I'm not like that. I'm a regular guy. I'm just looking like this, appearing like this, because I've got a project that I've got to accomplish here. So, so when the person believes him, and they're now in an understanding, they are both in a direct communication. See, because he's no longer communicating through the incognito identity, which would be indirect, but he's through a direct identity, which he is who he is. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is masked. There's no masquerade going on. So that's what how Kierkegaard is explaining the difference here. Uh, he sees himself, he sees him actually through the incognito. Now this man thinks he wants to go back and reestablish the incognito relationship. So he says, now how's he going to do this? So first of all, he started out 
as a uh, a gentle nobleman, and then he went into this role of being a, an egoist, and he's convinced everybody he's an egoist, and then he takes his friend and he convinces him, no, I'm not really an egoist, I'm really just a regular guy who I was before. Now Kierkegaard says, okay, now let's take him back to the other place again. This is why his stories are so hard to follow. <laughs> I don't think they're ever going to make a movie about this story here, or maybe they did The Imposter, right? The Imposter maybe kind of covers this. So if he in some manner creates a deception that he isn't a nice man, he goes back to the indirect communication, for he's now perceived as an egoist once again. So this is Kierkegaard's thought experiment, though, and is not saying that this is moral or ethical to do such a thing. But he's merely using this as a thought experiment to try to help us understand what he means by uh, direct and indirect communication. So now, back to the God-man again, now that he's distracted us with that story. Such a being is a contradiction, perhaps the greatest one we can imagine. That's why Kierkegaard uses this term paradox with a capital P. He's referring to this contradiction. But this was God's will, to suffer, and to be born as a man, and experience suffering and the forsakenness of God. Um, does that remind you of something, the forsaken, to experience the forsakenness of God? I know a long time ago you asked me about a question about Jesus on the cross and why he said something. Do you remember what he said? Well, yeah, it's, <clears throat> I mean, I, but it, I mean, he, he before he dies, right, he, cre he cries out, he's like, why hast thou forsaken right. me? I don't, I don't, right, I don't remember the, That's the exact words. I, sh I should know it perfectly, but, and this is sort of alludes to the potential double-mindedness of God, whether or not Christ knows everything that the Father right. does. Right. Right. If he's legit, if he's deprived of knowledge that the Creator has. Right. And this is some pretty great, com again, it traces... It leads us back to Trinitarian issues and perhaps creates Trinitarian heresies that you know right. so much about. Right. <laughs> right. And, and this was a sign of the contradiction. This is why it's part of the paradox. How could God say, I'm forsaken by God? So it's part of the paradox. But in order to truly understand that, and I can't remember what psalm it was in. Was it Psalm 13? Maybe you can check me out on that. It says, sure. my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, goes back to a psalm in the Old Testament. And if you read the whole psalm, you'll understand this verse a little bit more. Uh, so this was kind of a a uh, a statement that Jesus makes to, to get the reader to understand the context of which he means it in. But I'll continue on while you're looking that up. This unrecognizableness of a God-man is an incognito almightily maintained by God. So, now he's saying that in this paradox we have Jesus, and we'll have God incognito in this body of Jesus. So direct communication is an impossibility for one cannot recognize God directly for he, uh, for, for who he is as a man. So no one can directly see Jesus and say, oh, he's God, because this is an indirect communication with God. So, Yo, can I can I read Psalm thirteen? Yeah, please. Yeah, it's it's only six verses. So here we go. Uh, this is from the King James version. Psalm thirteen. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. So, that that uh, is, did I find the right passage? Probably. I think does it say in there, "My God, why hast thou forsaken me?" In that one directly, I, in the King in the King James, it says "forget." Oh, um, okay, yeah, okay, but okay, yeah, but maybe a different version. What 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 chapter was that? In? 
Psalm 13. Oh, I was right. Wow. Surprised myself there. Okay. So this, um, yeah, this is, we're hearing Jesus from the point of view of his humanity. It doesn't diminish his divinity. For me, it impassions it even more. He was fully God and fully man, how, how it goes. So as man, this is how he felt. And this was true feelings. This was the existential reality of Jesus. It's part of who he was. We can't take the man away from him. Uh, so, back to the idea of recognizing God in Christ. It's like the, those paradox. I, I don't know what they're called again. I call them paradoxical pictures. Where you could see the old woman and the young woman in the same picture. But not both at the same time. So your eyes can switch and you can see the old woman and they switch and you see the young woman. Uh, but you can't really see both at the same time. And this is the kind of the idea of, of the paradox of Jesus. Uh, you can understand him to be God and you can understand him to be man, but it's kind of impossible to understand him to be both. That's a, that's a good example. And when you do try to see him simultaneously, you get, some sort of cognitive dissonance, right? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and like when you try to see the young woman and the old woman, or like when you try to see the Wittgenstein duck rabbit simultaneously. Yeah. You're sort of... <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Yes, because it, it polar, your, your brain is polarized one way or the other. It, it is such a, a wonderful example. Do, does that have a particular name that you know of, that, that kind of symbol? I... I think it's, I think I'll look it up, but I think it's called like a gestalt switch or gestalt switch or something oh, like that. Okay. Uh, let me, let me look it up. Oh, okay. Well, don't, don't spend too much time on it now because I want your feedback too. So, sure. the, so now lesson three, and we'll probably won't go too much further here, but lesson three is the impossibility of direct communication. Indirect communication can be produced through reduplication of the communication. So now the whole, the, the rabbit hole, we go a little further into the rabbit hole, I guess is what you would say. Uh, the duck, ra the duck the rabbit duck hole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this sounds like a little bit of double talk here, but this is Kierkegaard's style of getting our attention, I think. Or trying to follow the mind of Kierkegaard is really like looking at a duck rabbit. Uh, sometimes his thinking may simply be how he comes to his own understanding. And we're just following his thinking as he's thinking out loud uh, or thinking as he writes. Uh, so he speaks about reduplication. That's when we reduplicate something, we talk about it, we take an incident and, and we speak about it, we're reduplicating it or we write about it. Um, then he talks about a term called double reflection. To be indirect, the communicator must become nobody. So, in the sense of uh, being the, uh, oh, what was the example we gave? Incognito. The, the true person must become a kind of a nobody. In other words, a communicator must not be part of the paradoxical statement. He has to be away from it. So, if we take two things, like jest and earnest, which are, uh, I'll compare jest and earnest, uh, we take opposites. Jest means to take something not seriously, to take something as a joke, where earnestness is the exact opposite. It means to understand something in its most severest way possible, in its most serious way possible. And these are opposites that just can't be fused together into uh, a dialectical knot, as Kierkegaard calls it. Uh, so, another one we might think of, it might be a little updated, is defense and attack, or defense and offense. Uh, you can't bring them both into a unity. You're either defending or you're attacking. So, one doesn't understand whether the action is a defense or an attack. So, when you make a statement here, and the other person hears it, and one person might say, well, that's attacking, you're attacking me. But the other person might hear and see it as a defense and say, well, you're defending yourself. So this is the idea Kierkegaard is trying to get us to think in this kind of idea. 
Our age knows no other way of communication than the mediocre way of lecturing. Uh, is this true, Luke, in the, in the academic world, that this is how we communicate through lectures? All right. I want you to, I want you to repeat that last thing again because I was oh. I was looking I was looking at consult switches. Okay. By by the way, I can see that duck rabbit. Yeah. With simultaneously with different if I, one eye can see the duck and one can see the rabbit. But I I I have an answer to your question, but I want you to re re say it so that I make sure I'm answering the correct question. Okay. And not making myself go cross eyed. Can you say it one more time? Okay. Our our age in our age. We know no better way of communication than the mediocre way of lecturing. Is this the main way of lecturing in the academic world that you've experienced it? Hey, I, 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 um, I, 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 I've experienced all sorts of educational methods. I have different views on them. Um, there was a time in my life where I thought lecturing was the coolest thing in the world because that mean that meant like, you know, someone was just passing on the information to me. I could jot it down mm -hmm. and they would reveal the mysteries of the universe and I wouldn't have to do all the heavy lifting. And I very much appreciate that. It was very efficient. And I felt like when teachers didn't do that, uh, they were kind of half-assing it. They were kind of phoning it in. Yeah, they were like, yeah. When they're like, "What does he say? What what does uh what does Aristotle say uh in this chapter?" and I'd be like, "I don't know. You're the teacher. You tell me." <laughs> um, and then there'd be a lot of times where I'd be in graduate seminars and we and the teacher would have some discussion questions and she wouldn't know the answer or he wouldn't know the answer and we'd all just kind of sit around trying to figure it out, mm. like just bounce it. And sometimes it would be generative and sometimes it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So. I, it's not monolithic. It's done in different ways. I will say this. I, I just, I made, I, I just finished up this audio book entry thing from the encyclopedia on, on Plato. And Plato talks a lot about, obviously Socrates is a main mm -hmm. figure for Plato and how Socrates never wrote anything down. Yeah. And he didn't, he didn't lecture. He, he did what we're doing. Yeah. Um, he, and he thought that was the only way to teach was to for it to be this unscripted dynamic conversation at, and and how abhorrent socrates would have thought the uh, or or maybe just how sophistic or how much it would have been just sophistry mm -hmm. if if socrates got to see that the modern academy was largely based around lecturing um i mean i'm going around about here the the methods in academia are are vast it tends to as you go higher within it it tend the more responsibility is given over to the students i guess i've noticed yeah. in upper level and graduate stuff um but that's not always a good thing i don't know i don't know what i don't know what the right blend is i ask myself this question a lot well it's it's kind of i just want to back away from this just a little bit more to, to, to add, add to your comment about Socrates. With Aristotle, it was a little different because Aristotle began to write down his teaching and his beliefs and his ideas. And when... Uh, we, 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 I should add this. I just, we think he did. Well, okay, well, we think, okay, uh, we think uh, he did. Yeah, this, this is an interesting thing. If you go back and you look at um, the Aristotelian works and how they're put together... Yeah. Um, there is, there is uncertainty about which books are penned by Aristotle and which ones are attributed to him, mm -hmm. uh, as a result of his disciples. And there's, it's actually, it's actually <clears throat> controversial from what I understand. Okay. Well, the, the, the point that I wanted to make was that Alexander the Great wrote a letter to Aristotle, and he said, how could you betray me? How could you do such a thing as to write your ideas down? Uh, so uh, it just kind of plays into the... Those because Ale Ale Alexander thought he had, like, he, he sort of owned them or something. Is it, was right. that the idea? Like, that they, they were, like, private communiques? Oh, They're like, yo, dude, you... 
You were giving me the mysteries of the universe. You can't give it to the vulgar masses. That's right. Only for the elite. Yeah. But I, I, <laughs> I think what Kierkegaard was getting at here uh, is that he's speaking about lecturing as the a direct means of communication. What he's saying is today we communicate directly rather than indirectly. And he makes the statement that we've forgotten what it means to exist. So in order to exist, he tells us, it requires a communicator, which is the reduplication of that which is communicated. Okay. So that, that we have to uh, unwind a little bit. To reduplicate is to exist in what one understands. So let me try to explain. Try to explain. I, I don't know if I, I got it here. But in a paradoxical form, there is no communicator. But a joining of double reduplication. There's no objective mediator between them. So when you have a paradox, nobody is explaining the paradox to you. It, it, so there's no direct communication with a paradox. Uh, the communicator is not part of the paradox or the message but he just delivers it. So in direct communication, I deliver you the lesson. I teach you the lesson. I write a book, give it to you. I give you a speech, give it to you. That's a direct communication because you are not part of the lesson. In this case, the paradox. Double reduplication here is a way of presenting faith in an ambiguous manner where the believer might see it as a defense of faith, while the unbeliever sees it as an attack. So, in, in the case that we have here of Christ, Christ, and, and we'll get into this later, but it seems like this is the right time to explain it, that Christ is a paradox. He is part of the paradox. His very being is the paradox. So Jesus isn't teaching something, He's being something. And this is what Kierkegaard is trying to get at, where he says, what's happened to existential being? This is what he's saying, is that Jesus, the God-man, is not a concept that needs to be taught or written about. It, it's something that is an existential happening. It's an occurrence. Jesus is the paradox not a teacher of it. So like you were saying earlier, and some religions say, well, yeah, Jesus was this cool teacher who, who taught us all about God, and, and he, he taught us the wonders and the mysteries of the universe. No, he didn't. He was the mysteries and the wonders of the universe. That's where Kierkegaard's main point is here that, that keeps resounding in my own ears every time I read him and every time I read Scripture. Uh, is that we're not reading a lesson about Jesus. We are reading Jesus. We are reading the paradox. And that's what we've lost. So we have to try to recover that somehow in our faith, this living paradox, not this doctrinal paradox. So, uh, when there is no communication, there's no objective factor to deal with. But when there is such a mediator, he must be considered. So when Jesus is the mediator in a sense of his own paradox, by being, he's teaching it. Uh, he has to be included in the paradox. So in our age, they know no other way of communicating without this way of lecturing or this direct way of communicating. And in this manner, the lecturer is the objective mediator. So uh, I get into it. So, so let me let me ask you this, okay? Because this ties into a conversation you or I were yes. having before we started the show. Lecturing about Jesus seems to be problematic because we're trying to put into words a mode of being. We're trying to mediate, we're trying to mediate the mysteries of the universe that cannot be put into human language. 
they can only be put into the incarnation that is Jesus Christ. So how do we, and that's, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a, I, we, we're, it's, it's kind of a, a false start to even think that's going to be effective to, to bring people to Christ. Right. So how do we acquaint people if it can't be done objectively, if it can't be done <clears throat> through lecturing and things like that, how do we acquaint people with the existential mystery that is Jesus? Is it through our imitation of Jesus? How do we do this? Yeah, and if everybody knew that, <laughs> if everybody lived their life as a Christian who said, it's not what comes out of your mouth, it's what comes out of your heart, they would live a little different life. In other words, if all the pastors said, it's not how eloquent my speech is, but it's how eloquent I live my life. It's, it's how holy I am, not how holy, holy I speak. Then they would understand the mysteries of the paradox. So what people are going to see in you and me, Luke, is not so much you, what you say. They've heard it all before. Remember you told me that? They've heard it all before. Well, I don't. I, I don't well, know. I, 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 okay, I, well, I, you have a little, I, I tell. You've got a couple. I have an. I have an angle that people are like, "Oh my God, is this guy actually?" Saying you may this have stuff? a couple wild cards under your sleeve. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you that. Okay, but for the average person like myself, um, wearing short sleeves, uh, the point is, I don't show them what it means to be a Christian by telling them about it. I show them by being the Christian. Well, what? How do we do that? I mean, I think I know, but I, 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 I yeah. How how do we do that? How do read we do the, that? How do just how, read the Sermon on the Mount as often as you can. <laughs> and no, that's what our goal is. We're not there, but that's what our goal is. So when someone mocks you, ridicules you because of your beliefs, you look at them and you say, you know, that's okay. I, I really do still love you. I really do still want you to believe. It doesn't hurt my feelings if you mock me or ridicule me. You know, they, they want to see you be different than everybody else. They want to see you Tell them about Jesus without ending it with, so how much can you contribute to my cause? You know, how much money can you contribute to my cause? They want you to end the sentence with, you know, I love you and, you know, you don't have to believe everything I say and you don't have to go to my church and you don't have to do anything. I just want to leave you with these words and that's all I want to do. I don't have any ulterior motives, none. That, that, that's the innocence of our project, of our witnessing. We have no um, other issues, no ulterior motive. You know, when I, when I started my prison ministry, Luke, <laughs> I got this guy who just didn't, didn't think I was authentic. And, and he just wanted to get out of, out of the, the jail cell for a little while and come and talk to somebody, you know? And I knew that, I knew that. And so I was sitting there talking to him, and he kind of smirks at me. And he's, he was one of these, well, I, I won't explain. But he looked at me and he said, I know why you're here. You're here so you can get a better place in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> like a scene from a movie. You no, know, yeah, yeah, that's what he said. And I said, I smiled at him and I said, that's not why I'm here. I said, I already know I'm going to heaven. I said, I'm here to help you get into heaven. You know, it, it, there's no, he knew at that point there was no ulterior motive I had for being there. Just that one motive, I wanted him to enjoy what I enjoy. And uh, that's what we all should be like. And I think if we could live that life as evangelists, we'd get, I don't know if we'd have more people, but what we would have would be more authentic people who believe in, in Christ. You know, you know, in all this time I've known you, I don't know if you've ever, or may I've forgotten, I don't know if you've ever mentioned your prison ministry days. Uh, 
is there anything about your prison ministry <laughs> days that is that that no i'm serious oh. is there anything about your, your your prison ministry days that translates into the non-imprisoned world quite well like what was the biggest thing that you learned from evangelizing to people who were in prison because the thing is what all right, my mentality is this is that we're all is that we're all in prison but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but not every but not not everybody on not yeah. very few people understand the nature of the prison they're in it's and, true that's and true. so so yes I, so so yeah how, how do you what about talking to real prisoners is applicable to talking about people who may not even realize they're in a prison I'll tell you what I learned and it was a shocking lesson for me. And I deserved the lesson. <laughs> One of the, the closest relationships I had with the guy in prison, I had it for a few years, I would say, with him. And uh, when we spoke about God, he would be so moved that the tears would come to his eyes. He believed so passionately that it, uh, it kind of put me to shame. I thought, wow, this man has an idea of visiting him. He should be visiting me. And uh, that was a lesson that I learned, that I had to be passionate as he was about what I believed. And uh, that woke me up. That really woke me up. So, yeah. Something to think about. It's, I never expected that to happen. But it was real. It was real. And that's, that's what I can say. I'll have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> well, do you want to... Do you want to... Do you want to leave it off yeah, there? Yeah, let's leave it. Let's off, leave off there on a high note. Let's uh, we'll pick right. it up here. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to us today and for allowing us to be a part of your life. Um, we'll be back soon uh, to finish this uh, finish this book up. In the meantime, go over to noetic.online, Online, create an account, enjoy the educational materials, and get the interaction going on over there. Thank you again, Bob Schutt, for leading this discussion today. Thank you, it's my friend and brother. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.